guys who are already here. My name is Sammy Anderson. I'm our marketing coordinator at Soft Acrylic. Like, like Jerry just said, this is a more intimate format of a webinar that we've been doing. We wanted to try it with more of our partners and clients and friends of industry. So it's much more you're getting this first, more exclusive from us. It's going to be more conversation-based. Uh, Jerry, our director of data activation, and Brad, our director of data science and analytics, are going to be divulging into data science, audience modeling, and activation, how they work together, how we can use that in marketing use cases. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, throw them in the chat, say hi. If you have any questions post-webinar, reach out to us, info at softcrylic.com, and make sure you are subscribing to our Insights in Minutes newsletter so you can get the cherry-picked version from our internal, external events sent straight to you weekly. And with that, I'm going to pass it off to Jerry and Brad. Thank you, Sammy. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for, um, for joining uh, like Sammy mentioned, it is it is a, a bit of an intimate uh, group, um, so uh, please uh, don't shy away if you have questions that come up. Uh, we we want to have this uh, in a in a way that uh, allows a discussion beyond what me and Brad are going to talk about. But um, for folks who don't know me, um, just quick, I'll, I'll introduce myself a little bit, and then uh, I'll pass I pass it to to Brad as well. Um, I lead the data activation team at Softcrylic. I've been with the company for over three years. Um, we are very fortunate that we are able to see the data journey uh, through, through every phase. Um, so uh, as part of that the, and the evolution of what, we, what type of data that we, we work with from day to day, um, the, the concept of audience modeling and coming up with new audiences um, has been coming up in many of our engagements. Uh, and this is where um, I'm fortunate enough to have someone and have a team uh, outside of my team uh, where, where Brad uh, leads the data science group, where we're able to take some uh, requirements and some use cases from clients that are looking to do something beyond the defining the, the logical A, B, and C, but like, what can we do that can push the envelope that can give us uh, more room to do uh, and be more creative. And this is where um, me and Brad and I, we've been, we've been doing a lot of this and we thought it would be good to share, share it with you. But um, I, I think this discussion will be introductory and, and we'll get into some details, but there, there could be a lot more uh, that happy to, to follow up if anyone has questions. Um, but that's me, and, and we're going to be chatting for a bit over the next hour. Brad, how about you? Thanks, Jerry. Yeah. Um, welcome, everyone. Thanks you, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Brad Kosman. I lead the data science and analytics practice here at Softcrylic. And one of the more interesting use cases that we've found recently um, across pretty much all of our clients to, to a greater or lesser extent is this concept of data-driven audience creation and identification. Um, Everybody tends to collect tons of data in marketing. And then a lot of times it, there's a question that arises, you know, how do we use all this data? And of course, uh, that converges really nicely with the fact that everybody wants to know their audience is better. So this entire concept is basically um, taking machine learning and applying it to audience data to create new audiences, to discover new audiences. And then once you identify those, we'll be diving into this a, a bit more deeply throughout the webinar, but once you identify those audiences, you now know things about them from a data perspective that can allow you to strategize um, and begin targeting them with messaging and in channels that they prefer to interact in, right? So um, this is really exciting. We've, we've had a, a lot of uh, interest in, in this service. We call it the audience modeling service. Um, and we work with, with Jerry's team to actually take those audiences and do something with them, right? So. Um, and they're the best at that in the business. So really excited to get this started, really excited to talk to you all about this today. It is probably uh, my favorite initiative on, on our team uh, right now, and we see a lot of promise in it. Excellent. All right, so that, let's, let's kick it off. I, I have a bunch of questions for you. Um, I, I, I can, so just a FYI, like Brad is, is one of the smartest people I know. Uh, and I, I thought I was smart and I have a PhD in engineering, but no, this guy is definitely on a different level. So let me be the guy in the audience who is, hears about data science from 
the tits and bits from from the web and AI and all that that fun jargon. Um, but like, what is audience modeling? I mean, we, we what are some of the use cases that uh, clients and me are coming to you to to add, to be like, hey, we want to do this, and you say, oh, let me tell you, audience modeling can solve that problem. What could be that? So we've seen stuff across the board. We have a. a a client in the uh, travel industry that's trying to sell a uh, more premium sort of product to their customers and they wanted to drive lift. They wanted to identify customers who uh, were had a higher propensity for uh, buying this more premium product, right? So that's very straightforward. You just, it, in, this, in that case, you're, you're kind of just trying to identify a specific audience for a specific product and then just aggressively message to them. We did see lift, by the way. Uh, we have another client who is um, in the health information systems business. And they're, they're trying to drive engagement with some of their uh, informational uh, material online. And so we're working with them to figure out, you know, how can we drive education uh, on site? So um, basically you can be uh, trying to action off these audiences out in through DSPs, DMPs. You can try to action on them on your own properties, right? Your website, email, things like that. Um, and the use cases are across the board. Anytime that you want to know who you should be targeting or who you should be thinking about, uh, this, this audience modeling sort of uh, approach is, is appropriate for your use case. So let me ask you this. Um, so what you mentioned, like for example, that use case of figuring out who is the right audience that we should um, market this you mentioned like a new trip or, or um, the travel industry uh, use case. Um, the question that comes to my mind is that, well, how long does it take to do something like this? And mm -hmm. how do I know that end of the day, you know, the audience that I identified is actually still current and valid? Um, and for example, this is an audience that might've changed over time or have already made that booking like, uh, or, or made that trip Re that real time aspect, and I do hate the word real time, but but you need some kind of, I you know, you need some kind of like, oh, how do I make sure that it's not taking me a month to do the modeling? And by the time I'm going to activate that, ah, it's too late. This is this information is stale. Yep. So there's going to be a running theme, I think, a lot today about uh, your data and, and how it gets refreshed and where it's warehoused and how easy it is to access and how clean it is. Um, Basically, you can refresh these audiences as often as you want, right? As long as your data is up to date, you can run this every day if you want to. So uh, timing is um, something that, that is entirely dependent on your needs and what kind of shape your data is in uh, effectively. Um, as far as like how long this would take to get set up, it doesn't really take all that long. We've, we've kind of have a standard roadmap um, that extends across one quarter and that, that uh, includes a lot of workshopping and, and iterations on this. Um, but once it's set up and ready to go, you know, you can tweak it and you can add new dimensions to it or whatever you want to do relatively rapidly. Um, as far as how up to date the data is, um, you can pull data for, for like the last three years, right? And use that as somebody's behavioral dimensions. Um, or you can just pull it over the last couple of months. A lot of this depends on your specific industry and sales cycle. Um, when we work with uh, B2B clients, for example, sales cycles tend to be extremely long. And so you want a very long look back window for the data. Um, you want to look back over a couple of years that, that your sales team's been in contact with them or they've been engaged with your website or whatever. Um, if you are in retail and selling fairly small items, then maybe your look back window is a couple of weeks, right? Because uh, somebody you know bought a pair of socks last week. Now they didn't, they'll need a pair of shorts or something like that. So um, all of that. And the way that we do this is we, we just try to tailor it to whatever the client's needs are. Uh, it has to do with the business, has to do with the sales cycle. Um, and, and that's really more of a, a strategist uh, decision than it is anything like a rigorous analysis that we can do. Okay. So you're, you're, if I'm paraphrasing what you mentioned, is that the use case drives how often this model needs to be refreshed, how often the data needs to be updated. And then based on that, um, there will be the decision of saying, well, since this is a campaign where we're gonna do it on a monthly basis, then doing the poll of data once a month is enough. But if this is something where it needs to be um, 
changing from time to time to say like what is the next best um, route to to recommend to you and you're on the website today then this is information where those models need to be as happening as as fast as possible right as often as, as possible okay yep. so so then the, the question i have is i mean how not from an expensive like how much money it costs to do something like this but like how involved is it like do we need does the client need to have their own infrastructure do they have to 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 run this in aws or the google or the, obviously there's so many options or like what is the is there is this only for like the big players right that have millions of dollars that they're able to spend on marketing spend or can can a small shop that that has a more tight budget from from a marketing but they can do something like this to, to a certain level yeah uh absolutely anybody can do this the specific approaches that we're using can take enormous amounts of data or tiny amounts of data. You can be a, a small, like a mom and pop store with like 50 customers and, and you can use this as long as you have a couple data points on them, it'll work. Um, My father-in-law runs his own auto shop in Detroit. So, yep. you know, if that would, that would be such an interesting use case. But yeah, yeah. yeah, as long as his CRM's <laughs> up to date and he knows his data, his Yeah, his data might be garbage, but it's okay. Yeah, that, that just happens. I, that's not an industry specific thing. Um, but uh, where was I? Yeah, uh, this is very open to anybody and you don't have to be on a cloud platform even. Um, you can run this on your workstation. Uh, it doesn't really matter. We use all open source uh, code for our framework. And um, we, we have the process down to a point that it's really fairly straightforward. It doesn't require a massive team. If you want to bring in a large team to strategize and brainstorm and ideate, you can. Um, but it's, it's just a really flexible approach as far as what is required um, on the human side of inputs. Yeah. So, so this, this is extremely interesting, but the question I have, and, and I know we actually, you and I tackled this at some point, is that, yes, it's great to know what is the end goal to be like, oh, we have a route and we want to figure out the best audience for it. Mm -hmm. But in some cases, I know there have been opportunity or been questions that we heard from clients where it's more about like, can you give me a different flavor of audiences that I can do stuff with, right? Like at, at, as vague as this sounds, yeah. but, but we've heard that. Like, how do you take something like this um, and, and try to do something with it? Communication. Um, so basically what we'll do is in the very initial stages of an initiative, we'll, we'll start workshopping and figuring out what data points tend to be interesting. Maybe there have been psychographic analyses done in the past, or maybe there's some sort of um, KPI or business objective that is an interesting data point that we can collect on individuals, right? So that's where it starts. Then we'll build these audience models. You'll get out a few different segments, and then those segments will have characteristics that you can then attach to a persona and strategize about that. What tends to happen is after the first time that we do this, everything becomes a little bit more concrete for everybody in the room and it becomes clearer like what direction this is going to go in. And so typically we'll add a few new variables that, that come to mind once we see the first outputs and we'll just iterate like that a few different times. And then in the end, what you'll have are these finely crafted uh, sort of data-driven audience segments that uh, what's so cool about them is that they, they tend to align very well with personas that marketing organizations already have in mind or goals that they have. And it just, it makes itself apparent exactly, you know, what a few of these audiences, what they can be used for and who they are. Um, that's a really sort of hand wavy answer to the question, but um, that's just the way the process works. It, it just, it, it's iterative. We go back and forth with the client, make sure that um, we're, we're meeting their needs. And these brainstorming uh, sessions tend to be extremely fun and, and kind of uh, invigorating as well. How much, uh, obviously there, there's been a change in the technology space where you mentioned like some of this can be done on the cloud, some of it can be done on your own machine, some of it can be done in some other tools that we're, we're gonna talk about in a bit. Um, but where do you think is the, if a client is trying to start something like this, and obviously 
we work with different clients where the, their analytics or this type of division varies, right? You have mm -hmm. folks who are very much mature on that. You have folks who this department does not exist, right? right. And But still, end of the day, they they're both are doing amazing things. But let's say for ones who don't have this in place today, like this is like a new thing they're bringing in. Um, what, how do, what would be the main things they need to worry about? Is it, for example, the data itself? Is it what to do with it? Is it the buy-in? Because like you mentioned the workshopping and we've been through this a few times and I've seen exactly the pain points. Yeah. Um, and let's talk through those so that people know what to expect. Yeah, so two of those three really stood out to me. It was the, the data itself and then the buy-in. Um, so the data has to be clean and you have to have it going back a reasonable period of time. And that's that's about it, but that's harder than it sounds because it has to be stitched together at the customer. Extremely level, hard. Right? So, yeah. so if you have third-party data, you have first-party data, you have website data, you have CRM data, all of that has to be stitched together at, at the individual level. We have to have an identifier for a specific individual. Um, that can be done. There are technologies in place to do that. Um, but in a lot of cases, um, less mature organizations aren't quite there with their data, right? So that that's step one, and that has to be done. Having said that, you can do this kind of approach on just one data set, like if you just have, um, say, Adobe Analytics data. Um, technically, you can, you can do this, and you'll get audience segments, but you just won't have that kind of... Um, 360 degree, that, that really, really broad view of, of your customers that you get when you start mixing different data sources together, right? Um, so is it fair to say the more, so, so if we're looking at, there's a dimension of how far back we can get data, but there's also how many of these data sources we can get. Is the idea that the deeper go more back and also more data sources that, that would be better for the analysis? Yes, more, more data is better with a slight caveat, and we discussed this just a little bit, that if you start looking back too far, the data might be irrelevant, right? It just depends mm -hmm. on your customer base and your, and your sales segment. So going broader is always a good thing. We can always just throw out you know, dimensions that don't make sense. Uh, going farther back is a mixed blessing in some cases. Um, okay. I, I do want to talk about buy-in for just a second, because I think that was a really great point to raise. Um, this, this process feels a little, it's, it's unusual to people. Um, even some organizations that have mature machine learning capabilities in place, I'll, in most use cases, I would say that, that those are things like, um, you know, propensity models, churn models, uh, that just, you put the data in the system, the system gives you answers, right? What we're doing here is fundamentally different because the system doesn't really give us answers. It just slices the data in a, um, a mathematically rigorous way. So it's not the way that people are used to dealing with ML or AI systems where it just handles its job and people get the email that they want and that's the end of the story. There's a lot of interaction here with the, um, with the code itself, um, with the outputs. Uh, you know, on our side, we deal with the code, but the outputs are- so There's a human, um, human aspect to this. It's not only- Yeah. Like it's, it's a man and machine thing. I mean, it could be a, like dramatized into a sci-fi the way that we have to interact with the data. No, I, I like it. I like yeah. it. Job security is always good. Yeah. 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 So, so that from a buy-in perspective, that's a little bit hard to deal with just because it's new. It's, it's new to everyone. And it's a little bit uncomfortable. It's not the way people have thought about audiences in the past, um, generally speaking. Um, and so getting people all on the same page and getting everybody to, to, um, you know, adopt the system is is occasionally a, a challenge, but I don't think we've had a case yet where it, where that didn't end up going well in the end. I think everybody has kind of gotten it by the end of the process and kind of sees why uh, things work the way they work, right? Got it. It's I think that's a very important point because uh, there is enough complexity about ML and AI, and then it becomes like, well, this is so complex and so amazing. Like you just, just set it up and you forget it. Like, yes, but if, and this is where our data activation comes into play and like, okay, this is great. What are we going to do with these and how are we going to test and learn from them so that I, there's value, right? Like, I'm just not going to take audiences and just put them out there and be like, oh, this is great. Like there needs to be a strategy behind it. 
So, yep. and I know we're going to talk a little bit about that. That's a great point that you brought it up. Um, in organizations that you're working with, um, who do you think are, you know, we talked a lot about marketing, um, having that need and, and such, but is, is that usually the, the audience that, that comes to, to, to you in, in these, with these things, or this, this can also be from different parts of the organization? I'm just curious. I don't know who do we have in, in the audience today, but I'm sure we might have some from IT, some from marketing, some from data analyst. Um, and it will be nice to see like how usually some of these requests come to, to place. Yeah, good question. Um, generally speaking, they come from marketing organizations, right? But there is, for example, a case where we have, where we're, we're kind of evaluating whether we can do this for a sales team. Um, and that sales team, right, they're trying to prioritize leads of various kinds and bucket those leads and they want to do it in a data-driven way. I mean, it's very, very similar to how you might do, um, to how you would do marketing, right? From, from a certain standpoint, it's just that instead of sending an, an email or whatever, now you're interfacing them with you know, directly with your sales team and, and trying to prioritize who to talk to. Um, you know, having said all that, is as long as your organization within your company uh, deals with your customers in some way, it's important to know who they are, right? So pretty much any use case where, again, you want to know who's in your audience or, you know, who are your customers, um, your organization can absolutely use something like this. Now, now the outputs, I don't know if they would be data activation as they, they tend to be with uh, marketing clients. Um, they might just be learnings and you can get some very, very valuable insights and learnings out of this because um, again, it's, it's just a, an approach that allows you to understand the deeper level in a truly data-driven fashion who your audiences are. And that's, that's a pretty unique um, uh, knowledge to have. I want to ask a question where uh, this is a question that I comes to my mind. Um, and I think it, it ties a couple of things that we kind of talked about. One of them is the real-time aspect. One of them is the type of data you work with. So many times when we talk about modeling with our clients, the first thing comes to my mind, comes to their mind and our mind as well, is look like modeling. Take my best customer. So it's very acquisition driven. Take my best customer, highest LTV. And, and just be like, I want more people like that. So I go, I take this audience, I run it against either my third party data provider or against my first party coming to my site, but they are not, you know, members or customers and look for mm -hmm. those and then pay more money to, to acquire them. The problem that we face with that is a couple of things. The, Lookalike modeling, I think, is one dimension, right? Because you're you're taking this is my best audience look like. I want people to look more like them. But then we're also facing the issue is that uh, when someone shows up on the site with third party cookies being a problem, with ITP, with the cookie list world, all this drama happening there, drama for a good reason, but. You know, it makes things a little difficult. Like if this is someone who showed up on the site I've never seen before, like how am I going to do look like modeling or use models to really figure out like what is the right thing to do? Right. Um, what is it? How do you, you know, I'm sure this is something you're going to think about. Um, I mean, you're, this is more of an activation problem, but also what could do you think from a modeling perspective can be done so that we know we are limited and our hands are tied a little bit with what we can do, but we can gather enough information that we can do something with it. Right. So incomplete data is something we deal with a lot, right? You'll have some customers who you know everything about. You'll have some customers who you barely kind of just saw a glimpse of them on your site. And that's, that's basically all you know. Um, mm -hmm. this, this approach actually can deal with that very well. Um, I don't want to get into too many technical details here, but basically you, you can have data as inputs and data as outputs, and you just use your incomplete data as outputs. So you're, you're modeling everybody based on sort of a, an even playing field where you know the same variables about them. And then on the output side, uh, if, even if you just know two or three people in, in a specific audience, even if you just know these data points for them, 
you can kind of directionally estimate what those data points are like for everybody else. So mm. that's, that's one approach that's obviously not ideal. I mean, ideally, you know everything about everyone. Uh, well, ideally from a technical <laughs> standpoint. I'm not sure if that... That you know, didn't come out very good, but that I didn't come out well. <laughs> Sorry, that's, that's not what I meant. Um, but yeah, ideally, <clears throat> you have sort of, let's say, um, complete data situational awareness. How's that, how's that ring? Um, that's, that's more professionally. Yeah, I, I like it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, but then, so, so it is sort of like lookalike modeling in, in that sense, because what you're doing is you're building segments of people who look like each other from a data standpoint. Um, and then from those segments, of course, you can build actual lookalike models as long as you have identifiers that, that you can, um, uh, you know, share with, with whatever platform you're trying to uh, target people with. Right. That's very interesting. Okay. Um, okay. So one, one thing that we have, we have done working with you is, is usually the initial outputs that we get. And I think you touched a little bit on that, but I want to talk a little more about it because I don't think people pay that much attention to it and they think it's magic, but there is your, the outputs of what you guys do in terms of the modeling. Um, it's not always a story where it's like, here is, this is the persona, this is exactly ABC. Um, it's usually like a lot of signals, right? Like in a heat map fashion, like showing us like, hey guys, here's some really interesting stuff. Um, where do you go from there? What, do you, what is usually the process of taking these signals into something more tangible? Yeah, yeah, you, you touched on a really critical point there. And that is, that kind of goes back to what we were talking about with uh, people are used to AI and ML just giving them answers, right? You, you plug something into an image recognition system and it tells you that's a German Shepherd or that's a cat, right? It gives yeah. you the answer. <clears throat> Whereas here, we're just taking these signals and trying to determine who, you know, who the audience is uh, as, as human beings, right? So you mentioned a heat map, this, the outputs of this, as you said, they're basically just a heat map that shows you here are say five different segments of your audience. And here are um, various variables and how they compare between these segments, right? So you'll have some segments uh, tend to over index in a specific uh, behavior, and you'll have other segments that tend to under index. And from there, like say, uh, people that tend to click paid search ads, right? It'll be very easy to see across these, the set of audiences, who tends to engage most with paid search and who does not, right? So right there, that starts to give you some idea of who they are because you know what kind of channels they like to interact with you in. Um, if you're say a retail oriented client, just because that's, that's kind of uh, easy to understand. <clears throat> if you have specific product categories, um, those will get broken out between the segments and you'll see that some uh, uh, segments prefer certain categories of products that they get from you and <clears throat> other segments have different sort of products they're interested in. You just, kind of take all these signals in and you start thinking about, you know, who these people are and you, you come up with a hypothesis. You say, okay, I think this third segment here are people that um, tend to interact through display and they like to come buy uh, shirts from my, from my store, right? And then you compare that to the other audiences and you see if that, that still makes sense. And you say, yeah, they definitely do over-index in these two ways. And you move on to a, another um, segment and you start defining them in that way. And you just, you keep iterating on this until you really have good descriptors for each of the segments and who they are, how you strategize to them, um, how you can reach out to them, whether they engage with you via marketing at all, um, or maybe you have some uh, segment of, of customers that you want to suppress even, right? Um, so that's that's really how you do it. It's, it's a very organic sort of process. You just start looking at the data and it looks really intimidating at first because it's just a giant heat map and you don't have the answers and just try to, you know, do it one little piece at a time until you, you have some ideas and then you gut check those ideas until you arrive at a stable solution that makes sense. I'm, it makes sense, but what make me worried is that it's, it's not like it requires like that process, right? So it's yeah. not only, Hey, let's, let's get this data but let's um, do the modeling, let's get the output, let's really interpret, uh, try to understand what does this really mean? And then from there, then let's say, how do we, what do we do with it, right? This is right. where my team comes and says, oh, this is great. Um, okay, okay, so it is, it is a process. Um, and I, I'm, 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 I, I've been through it many times 
where I, I see the value in it, but it is, it's a process that makes, takes commitment and takes time. Right. Yeah, absolutely does. And, um, and there's always testing, right. To fall back on in case, and this gets more to your wheelhouse, but if you're unsure of, uh, your hypotheses about who these, these customers are, you can always just try to message them and see if you get lift. And if you do, then yeah. you're right. Yeah, I, I think this is one of the, yeah, I, I, let, let's talk a little bit more about that um, because that's something where that the question comes up to say, oh, great, we, we identified an audience and we figured that this audience, they are, they have X amount of products, they are this age frame, they live in this area, and we believe that they are a good fit for, um, I don't know, an upsell, right, or cross-sell. Um, but then we kind of need to prove that, right? Like um, that's the part becomes, uh, we're not just gonna go and just say, okay, this is great. I trust you, man, this is awesome. We're gonna, we're gonna go after it. We, there needs to be a testing plan with it to, to prove how, that, how real that thing is. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. So let's, let's shift things around. But um, I'm sure yep. people want to hear more about data activation as well and how that plays well. So yes. where do you want to start? I want to start at the beginning. And I didn't know when I joined Softcrylic what data activation was. And I'm not sure everybody oh, yeah. does either. So I think, I think it'd be a good That's right. place to start. Like, what is data activation? And how does it tie into this whole process that we're talking about? Where, where does your team come into play here? Yeah, yes. Um, data activation. I feel like I kind of, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't say I came up with the term, but um, I really like the term because you have data analytics where they're analyzing data. And I was like, hey, what about data activation? We actually do something with the data. Yeah. So um, at SAF, uh, part of our team, what we do from a data activation perspective is it can, it can be different things depending on the use case, but also depending on the technology that the client has. Mm -hmm. The idea is we have a data point and that data point uh, is giving us an insight. It's giving us some information. Um, we have the option of putting it in a report and a dashboard and just looking at it and be like, oh, that's great. We have um, X percentage of our people who are this age and they, um, they make this purchase versus saying, okay, let me do something with it. So this doing something with it is activation. It can be either let's uh, try to engage with them when they come to the website, or let's try to engage with them on social or engage with them on uh, programmatic advertising, even on TV, let's say if we wanna do over the top. So there is so many mediums where we can reach audiences. It's a, a, blessing, and a blessing and a curse, right? Uh -huh. Like uh, where, Obviously, this has been abused, uh, and this is why there's a lot of these things with ITP and third-party cookies where you see a product that follows you everywhere. That's not data activation. Data activation is more about knowing or having an instinct about what we think you might be interested in and for us to, to make it more available to you uh, on the mediums that, that uh, you, you use. So email, um, website, social um uh, different partner websites or even mm -hmm. now it's becoming you know mobile right like the idea that we're able to activate and if you are if you if you're a client you have an app and uh let's say you're in in the quick serve industry um and you're you want to be able to reach someone with like an offer or like uh, telling them that hey we have a new product new sandwich or and we know that you like it, like because you've bought this before, or because Brad came up with a motto and said, like, people who buy stuff like you do are actually gonna love this new salad that we're creating. Then we wanna be able to reach you on the app because we know that you wanna hear about it. So, so that's there's different ways that data activation come to play. I am very pro privacy. Mm -hmm. um, so and, and I'm, I'm very big on it and I'm, I'm, I try, although sometimes it's really hard to, to make sure that what we do with data activation is keeping in mind that there is a consumer at the other side. I am a consumer and we just need to be respectful of their privacy and also how often do we communicate with them and when do we say it's time not to do anything? Yeah. So all of this plays into data activation. Yeah, that's, 
<clears throat> that's really a good point uh, about the ethics and, and having to, just because you can do something right doesn't mean you should. Um, oh yeah, there's so many times I've we had to have that discussion with clients. Yeah. Right. Yeah. To be like, well, we should send this email like and follow up with the push notification. And also when they come to the site, I was like, maybe we need to put a cap on this and just figure out why some people want to see all this versus other people like, okay, tell me once. And if I decide to do it, great. If not, just stop telling me about it. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned technology. Um, what types of tech does data activation require? And what are kind of nice to haves? Can you just give like sort of a brief overview? Because I know that space is huge, but um, what are some common technologies that people might come across and, and be able to associate with data activation to kind of understand from an implementation standpoint what we're talking about here? Yes, uh, it's, it's a great question. I think the, the space is evolving so quickly, um, the same way that what you guys, the amazing stuff that you guys do from a, from a data modeling, there is the technology to, to activate or what we refer to as light up these experiences have been evolving so quick, right? So, so obviously there is tools that from a marketing automation um, to allow us to personalize, for example, emails, right? So if I identify that this person is in this cluster that we decided that we want to market to them this category of products, then I will be able to personalize the email to, to be relevant to that person. Mm -hmm. I will be able to personalize the website using, for example, and you know, there's so many email solutions and there's so many web, web testing and optimization solutions um, uh, that, that I'm able also to uh, personalize your site experience. But I can also send you as, as a device ID into, into the open, open air, right? To be like, hey, uh, I might be able to find you on programmatically um, on an NBA.com looking up scores. And, and I find that you're there and I'm like, okay, this is the right time. I'm gonna go and show you something. Um, it's the limit, I mean, there's really no limit on, on the different ways. Uh, I think some of the technologies, obviously Adobe is a big, uh, they, they have a lot of these solutions, um, the big ones like the Salesforce, the Adobe, the Oracle. Um, a lot of this used to be uh, very much driven, especially when, when you're thinking about acquisition versus engagement, right? Yeah. So in an acquisition, we used to heavily use data management platforms, DMPs back in the day. Uh, that's that's my baby. This is where I, I spent a lot of time and I, I was very passionate about that technology. Unfortunately, that technology is dying slowly but surely. So a lot of that have been shifting into CDP, customer data platforms. Right. We've had a lot of talks about CDPs. They come in in very different, you know, uh, I would say some are driven from, from attack management. Some are driven from mobile, some driven from identity, um, there's different flavors of CDPs. Um, it's an abused, um, I would say, technology in terms of acronym because uh -huh. everything now has become a CDP. Uh, and I've, I've, I've had, we've had multiple webinars on that. But, but the good thing here is a lot of these CDPs um, have either evolved from marketing automation or, or became CDP with the mind, with the idea that there needs to be um, room for algorithmic and modeling, whether this is happening at a low level within them or allowing these models to be brought in yep. and merged with the, the profiles and information that we have uh, or using them to, to do acquisition, right? Like we talked about the lookalike modeling, you know, uh, CDPs might not have the capability to bring third-party data in and merge it with your own first party, right? That becomes like a privacy concern, uh, unless this is happening in a safe haven. But you're able to, for example, to anonymize your first party and send it into the CDP and let the CDP uh, model it. Not maybe, maybe not the CDP. It might be on the on the DSP level or the the programmatic and do the modeling over there. Uh, but yeah, there's so many different ways. I would say uh, it depends on how much money you have. 
and how much, what are you trying to accomplish? And, and also like how sophisticated you want to get. Um, we have clients that real time is really important to them, right? So someone calls to complain or someone calls and um, to the call center and complaining about a problem, it would be really nice to know some information about them ahead of that call. It would be nice to, to have, for example, a model to say like, where is Jerry's sentiment right now based yeah. on everything that he's been doing, right? Like if, if I can get a model from Brad that tells me, oh, Jerry is in, in a happy medium today versus Jerry is angry because <laughs> everything he's doing, we might not know that he, he did not like tell us anything, but he had a problem with, a, with an order. He, he spent way too much time on the website trying to, to add to cart. He was not able to log in. These are all signals that might be in real time that I, as a call center, um, I want to know. So then when I pick up the phone, like I'm not clueless and I'm trying to, to uh, at least I know what, what Jerry, why Jerry is here, right? So that's a long-winded answer. Yeah, that's a good one. I, I, I can't picture angry Jerry, but maybe he exists oh boy. in the parallel universe. Anytime you want. <laughs> <laughs> exists exists okay heavily. i'll take your word for it um so let's tie this into the audience modeling then a little bit so i i think that we've we've discussed what the audience models are they're basically audience segments and then there's kind of this bridge into data activation where you're actually doing something with those segments um very open-ended question here, but do you have any best practices? Like how does your team think about these things from a strategic standpoint? Um, how, how would you leverage these audience segments uh, in, in a general sense, or if you have specific examples that you think are interesting? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think um, we've done this few times, right? Like uh, a lot of times I would say where it's, uh, we've learned from it. And I think the, um, the, the best practice of my perspective is one, really start small. Start like you're, even if we're able to identify so many different clusters and models, like we need to agree on which one we should, we should try to go after. And then um, start with testing and learning, right? Like mm -hmm. before you go and spend, say, I'm going to put a budget and, and try to retarget them um, let's, let's use our own environments, right? Like you have your own channels, your email, um, your, even if you're doing direct mail or if you are doing, um, you know, on your website, uh, or in the app, these are your own channels, um, test there, test small. Um, it's really surprising to me still to today, how testing and learning is still like an afterthought for, for some clients. And these are clients that are doing so well, right? Like, but, but they have opportunities for them to, to get to know a little bit more because one part of testing and learning is that one, you're verifying how good that cluster is. Two, you actually might be getting some more learnings that can feed into that cluster eventually or into the modeling for the next time around, right? Um, so testing and learning, I would say it should be top of mind. Um, the, the piece that um, we, we've seen a lot of effort, that, like obviously the process itself from coming up with the idea to do data modeling, doing the data modeling, getting the data in a place where you can do data modeling, then getting this data into the channel where I can now do something with it, and then doing it, testing and learning, this is, this is a process, right? Like not yeah. only that we have team to do, but this requires commitment from clients. And in many cases, clients have, they're running their business and this is a, a new thing that they might not be able to do. But the problem that we've seen a lot is we will get engagement through this, this process might start high and slowly and slowly, 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 like you lose interest, you lose budget, you lose people. By the time you get to activation and you're doing testing and learning, it's like, oh, you know, this is great. This was fun, guys. This is awesome. So yeah. what we we've been pushing our clients from the beginning is like, listen, um, we're going to get paid regardless, but I really want to see this happening well. So 
what we do is we try to set up at, at the end when we start doing this is that we are documenting, we are showcasing this, we are telling people in the company of how well this is doing because this becomes like the booster, right? Yeah. We might be able to do this with one group and then this group gets a little bit lift or gets success. Yep. And and obviously, I mean, we're working with digital data, like measuring lift. Sometimes there is dependency on other platforms that or other data that we don't have. So so this is this is a, a very complicated process. But let's say we get successful there, we're able to showcase that, then this becomes the momentum that we need to do it again and larger and bigger. Yeah. 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 That's all rings true with me certainly um we've got a few minutes left i think what we want to talk about at least a little bit is aep because yes. that's a platform that we've been using a lot for this um and i know jerry your team has been playing with it a lot on a variety of different clients and obviously we've been using it a little bit and it just it ties in really perfectly to this entire topic because of what its capabilities are this is not an AEP sales pitch or anything like that. We just, we think the technology is interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah. So Jerry, can you give us just a broad overview of what AEP is for anybody that doesn't know? Absolutely. So AEP is Adobe Experience Platform. Um, we actually, for anyone who haven't heard of this, um, we have a webinar specifically about AEP that we talk about in more detail. And we have a couple of blog posts on our website. So feel free to check it out. But the idea of AP in a nutshell is that it's Adobe looked at, you know, Adobe marketing or experience cloud is, is initially was, it was built based on uh, single solutions that started integrating together, right. To, to be service, to service every part of the journey, right. Whether it's email or website content creation, programmatic is just this, they start putting the puzzle together, but then after some time, everyone figured out, okay, this is great, but these don't integrate well. These are so solutions built on different platforms, different data collection, different IDs. You really cannot execute in a seamless experience by, by integrating them. So what Adobe done is they created this Adobe Experience Platform. So the idea is it's a data lake that allows you to bring data into it, whether it's streaming, batch, it's very, very configurable. Um, in that data lake, you're able to have individual data sets. From these data sets, you can create a unified customer profile. So it can be very much customer uh, centric. That customer profile can be activated through a CDP. Uh, it can be activated through uh, creating segments for analysis. It's, and also hook into any of the other Adobe solutions they have today. But what's interesting here is that given that you have a data lake and you have data sets, um, Adobe also created this space called Data Science Workspace. What this allows you is to sit on top of these data sets and using a query service, and obviously, Brad, you're, you're the pro in this, but uh, using between Data Science Workspace, query service, having the data there, then it's there, right? We can do everything that we wanna do there itself. Um, this way, the, the hope is that the data is clean because it's been cleaned up before brought in. The, there is a lot of data because the idea is that data lake is gonna host your own member data or customer data, the web data, the, the email data. It's supposed to be like that place. Um, and then from there, it's activation, right? Like if I decide, oh, I came up with clusters and I wanna activate, I don't need to move this data from this system to another system. So it is definitely a dream uh, for, data activation, a dream for data science, like merge together. Um, but also, obviously, there's no technology that's perfect. Um, so, so maybe what, when in the, in the next few minutes, I, maybe you can give, I want to shift it to you, just give your perspective. You work with data science workspace, you okay. were able to do some modeling in there. We've been successful with it. But, but also we've seen like there is room for growth within that, within that piece. What, what, would, what is that like? So, yeah, I just want to kind of echo some of the things that you said. It, the, the whole concept of a fully integrated platform like this, right, all the way from data collection to activation, and you, that can be piped through modeling or, or any other um, the sort of data transformations that, that you want. 
that's a very cool concept and it it works right and i think we're seeing the tech space more broadly move in that direction um there are uh, data platform efforts uh say azure synapse that are giving you modeling capabilities that are in close proximity to where your data lives right so you have one ui and under this tab i can create new schemas and bring data in and under this tab i can run spark jobs in python and and actually do data manipulation and then of course one line in the script populates a new table in the database that, that can be accessed by any other um by any other technology or users or, or anything right so that is very cool um and it tends to work well in aep for the most part uh querying the data from like you said jerry your your sort of data lake that's pretty much a breeze and it works great um it's also nice because AEP has within the, the data warehouse, the data lake itself, yeah, there's sort of a natural data dictionary that lives there that kind of tells you what these variables are. You can preview data sets quickly and so forth. Mm -hmm. That's really important when you're running any kind of modeling to be able to just take a quick peek at a data set to see if this variable really is what its name says it is and you know, scroll down 100 rows and do we have any kind of quality issues, just little gut checks like that, that, that just come naturally. That's a great point. So, so getting all that data so proximal to the data science workspace is very cool. It's very time saving. Um, and then all of this is organized around how marketers and, and marketing analysts view their data sets and, and, and use them. So that's all very smooth. And then within the data science workspace, Currently, you have basically two different options. One is you can run a notebook. Uh, notebooks are mainly for like exploratory analyses. So if you're just trying to uh, load your data and do little, you know, find statistics, right? What's the mean, standard deviation, basic stuff. Um, or you can do sort of basic machine learning with these notebooks. Um, it's all hosted in the cloud. You can um, you can tweak how much hardware you have, how powerful that hardware is. So you can theoretically run fairly substantial uh, workloads in these notebooks. The only problem is that it's you can't really automate them. So if you, for example, want to refresh this audience modeling process that we've been talking about, and you have that hosted in a notebook, somebody has to actually log in and do that and make sure that all gets done. Um, so that brings up the second uh, possible way to run uh, machine learning in AEP, which is uh, what they call recipes. And these are very formulaic sort of um, I don't want to get into too much technical detail. Basically, there's a, a paradigm that you fit your code into, and then that can be automated. And, and this is great for things like propensity modeling, churn modeling, um, things that, that you don't really need to supervise very much. Once it's it's set, you kind of just let it go. You check in on it once in a while to make sure it's not doing anything crazy. And, and that's the end of the story. But it doesn't really work for the audience modeling because the way that it's built um, and the way that our machine learning framework is built, they just don't really mesh very well. So one thing that I'm, I'm hoping for at some point in the future is sort of a more flexible uh, way to just schedule any job that you want, right? Instead of having to fit within a specific um, programming paradigm, you can just upload a script and just trigger it once a day, something like that. Right. Um, that's really the major limitation. Other than that, you can read and write data back to the uh, data warehouse. Um, you can run basically anything you want in Python, SQL R, um, and you have a pretty broad range of options as far as hardware. So it's good. It, there are just a couple of things that we're still waiting on, and I, I suspect Adobe's working on those. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm sure. That's a great point. I, uh, that makes sense in terms of creating the recipes so that they at least um, keep some control over it, right, in terms of how often these things can run. And yeah. then uh, my guess, given seeing all other, other Adobe products, is that that's usually like, in the first iterations and eventually this will expand mm -hmm. um, that's a great great way to summarize it um brad i think i think this this has been wonderful um i can't believe we we've been speaking for an hour about ani's modeling and activation and i feel like we can talk for more yeah um i i want to thank you for sharing the knowledge obviously this video will be posted on our youtube channel and our site so folks can watch it again and i think we need to have a part two um, of this. Uh, maybe next time we can have uh, a guest, some, someone from our clients who we've been working with um, to come in and give their perspective. I think that would be, would be a great story to tell. That's a great idea. And Jerry, thank you as well for your time, because this is, 
none of it matters if you can't get the data and the audiences out there into the real world, right? So absolutely, love your absolutely, perspective. absolutely. All right, well, Sammy, thank you for organizing this, and thank you for everyone who attended. Um, I think um, there is uh, for for people to learn more about what we more about Ani's modeling. We we have a link that we will we'll send over, but it's bitly uh, slash uh, audience dash modeling. So we'll um, we'll send this over and we'll have it on our website. But thank you all for attending, and hope everyone have a good day.